Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are we tonight? I don't know if you did what I did today, but uh, my family took me out for red lobster. And I'll tell you, I went off my program. And I didn't offend the chef today. I had so many, have you ever been to Red Lobster and had those little buttery buns? Oh, I'll tell you, they're to die for. I had about five baskets of those. And uh, then I had a little bit of a main course, you know. No dessert, so I was good there. And I'll tell you, I'm just over the top tonight. I don't know if that's spiritual, but I'm over the top. But anyway, how did everybody else have a good day? Everybody get a rest or? That's good. Did anybody tinkle the cup like I was? Did you, did you have the nerve to try that, man? Yeah? Not yet. All right. Well, we've got some more cups up here. Was anybody here, uh, not here this morning, and didn't get one of these beautiful cups? You'll want to pick one up after. I'll show you how it works. These are special cups. Now, I've been in, I was in sales most of my life. The, have you ever heard of fab? That's a sales, a sales term, fab. It means features and benefits. Now, if you ever teach anybody how to sell a product, you always introduce them to ta uh, tag, uh, fab. Okay, so fab is, like let's take this pen for instance. This is just an ordinary pen, but it has features and benefits. Some pens only have a little lid that you stick over the top. So when you put it in your shirt, if it's not on securely, you get ink in your pocket. This has a hideaway little clicker. The other feature of this beautiful pen is you can put it in your shirt. See, it's got a clip, so you don't lose it. So when you're bending over, you don't lose it. Features and benefits. Salesmen need to know the features and benefits. And also, you can unscrew this and put a new refill in. It's a pen for life for only $6.99. <laughs> How many would you like? Okay, now I'm going to talk about fab with this cup. This is a beautiful porcelain cup been through the fire, durable, lasts forever. It has a handle, that's a feature. You know what I mean? It's wonderful, it has some nice letters on it, but it also comes with a spoon. Now you can't find that everywhere in every dollar store. This is special. It has a feature, it has a handle, holds eight ounces, put lots of cream and sugar in here, and you can dip your, you can use this to get your sugar, and whatever else you put in your coffee. There you go. Got a rack. Features and benefit. These sell like hotcakes. These are wonderful for only $25.99. <laughs> See me after the service. But anyway, it also comes with another feature. It has a calling card. Men, this is special. Pastor thought of everything. He knows all about fab. And he got a spoon and he's got a coffee cup. Fathers will want to have this cup. Every time you get a refill, you go and your wife runs right to the cup. It works like magic. Now I'm telling you, features and benefit. Every man ought to have one of these. Okay? Women, I don't know how much you're going to enjoy this, but the men. Oh, music to my ears. It also comes with extra spoons. I haven't been known to break a few spoons because sometimes she doesn't come as soon as I would wish. <laughs> sometimes my coffee gets a little cold. But if you tap these too hard, the benefit of this is it'll break. So there's a whole box of them under there. So if you need one, let me know. Now, girls, look after your husband. You only celebrate it once, but this is a beautiful cup. Pastor... Pastor Rich, if you're watching, I'm sure you are. And I'm sure you're uh, getting, get on with it, Bill. Come on. But anyway, I was requested, Pastor, by Bob Gordon to do the feature. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, if you haven't had one of those yet, after the service, I mean, don't run up now and get it. But after the service, help yourself, okay? Hey, Amen. Hey, that's, that's good. Okay, I'm going to give you a few announcements. Uh, tonight we have Faithway College 
and the singers with us, these fine gentlemen and these women, and they're going to come and sing for us, and we're going to have a great night tonight. This is a real good night. We've had a great day in church today, haven't we? Yeah. Well, tonight we're going to have another blessing, and uh, we have Pastor Tag with us tonight, McTag, yes, pronounce it right, Bill, and uh, his wife, Christine, and uh, he's going to be bringing the message later. So they're going to take the whole service, which is really a blessing for us. Pastor Rich knows what he's doing. He, he's given us a great day today. So let's stand together, and we're going to sing our opening hymn here. And this is a wonderful hymn. This talks about how our, our Heavenly Father is so awesome and wonderful. And let's sing it tonight as a prayer and a thanksgiving unto our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father is so wonderful. We had some folks over today for uh, after we had our lunch, and we were talking about how good the Lord is, and He's wonderful. And this song just uh, gets us in the mood and gives us a thanksgiving heart for how great God is. Where would we be without the Lord? Oh boy, I wouldn't want to even think about it. I'd probably been dead years ago. But the Lord took me out of the miry clay Amen. and he set my feet upon the rock. Amen? Oh, he's so wonderful. Let's sing about it tonight. Sing with all your heart and sing it as a prayer. Together. Almighty Father, you alone You know, I was just watching you sing out here. You guys are great singers. I was watching the young ones. I always watch Emilio Jr., Jr., Jr. He's always singing. He don't just sit there and take up space. This guy is right, he's right with it. And I was also watching Sue. Sue, yeah, I just enjoy watching you sing. That's amazing. She's a great lady, and I just love her. And you know, when I had my stroke a few months ago, guess who lended me their walker? Sue. She said, Bill, I don't need it. You can take it. I borrowed it for a couple months. Finally, I said, do you need it back? Oh, no, you keep it. I said, oh, no, I'll bring it back. Isn't that amazing? My sister lends me her walker. Boy, blow me away. The Lord is so good. Well, you know, we're going to have a couple of quick songs because I always like to have you sing favorites. Does anybody have a favorite? Come on now, you got to get with it. Two four zero. Let me get my book. We're gonna sing the first verse of that in the chorus. What was it again? Two, two four zero. 
I hope we know this one. Guys are pretty tricky. Two four zero. Well, that's good. Isn't it good to get together as brothers and sisters in the Lord and sing to the Lord? Just to worship him and exalt his name. Jesus, lover of my soul. I'm sure I know this once I hear a tune. Do you know this? Oh, I got the wrong book. Boy, oh boy. Well, thanks very much. It's not the right, oh yeah, okay. No, no, I can find it. Liddy, I'm not helpless, you know. Kinda, 240. Okay. Here we go. Lily of the Valley, this is a great song. I found a friend in Jesus. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of the thousands in my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. I learn his friends and make me In sorrow, he's my comfort. In trouble, he's my sin. He tells me. Bright and morning sun, and he's the fairest of ten thousand to us. Oh, let's do verse three. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna, he my hungry soul shall fill. Sing then. Sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where the rivers of delight shall never flow. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, and he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Amen. Anybody else have it? Bob? 390. <coughs> Yeah, this is a challenging song, isn't it? Have I done my best for Jesus? You know, I know an evangelist, and he said to people that are lost, um, if you died today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? They say, well, I'm doing the best I can. And you know what he says to them? I don't know anybody that does their best all the time. He says, you make resolutions at, on New Year's, and you can't even keep them for three or four weeks. So the best you can do just doesn't count with the Lord. But we as Christians have an opportunity to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. We can be the good ground in the sower of the seed parable that brings forth 60, 30, 60, and 100 fold fruit. Amen. And that's a great opportunity that we have as Christians. We don't want to let that slip by. We can be other kinds of seed, but let's be the good seed. And that's what this song is challenging us to do. Have I done my best for Jesus? Amen. Sing it as a prayer and a challenge. I wonder have I done my best for Jesus who died upon the cruel tree to think of his sacrifice at Calvary. I know the Lord expects the best from me. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chains I've helped to free? I wonder have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me. Amen. What a hymn. Anybody else? Yes, uh, Rick. 76, what is the order? 7. 76. Oh, 76, 76. What if it were today? The piano player just quit on us.
Rick, do you want to come and help me with this? Um, okay. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah. We're going to show these Faithway people what a group we are. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you. All right, I'm just not sure how it starts, right? But I'm mm -hmm. sure I can pick it up. You know. Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it were today? Coming in power and love to reign. What if it were today? Time for one more quick one. Yeah. 398. 398. Okay. <coughs> oh, this is a great song. This is a great song. Good soul winning song. This is a wonder. I remember singing this in school. Can you believe that back in the day? I'm not going to tell you what age that was. It was just after the Stone Age. In the schools, they used to have the teacher would sing songs like before we started the class. And I remember singing, uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Remember that? I don't know if you're old enough to remember that. You all look pretty young out there. But this is another song we used to sing. Into a tent where a gypsy boy lay. people when we get to heaven and find out how many missed opportunities we've had where people would say why didn't that Bill Hicks tell me about the Lord I rub shoulders with him every day and he never told me what and that's not gonna be sad we got to be partners with the Holy Spirit and get the word out amen it's not a hard thing to do it's just uh, it's just a fear factor you get over amen and the old devil he's there to tell you who do you think you are talking to these people? Look at what you do in your life. You're, you're not a good example. You better not tell anybody. They'll know all about you. But I say to the devil, hey, that means I'm going to tell them. Amen? And I'll tell you, I've talked to people that I was intimidated to talk to, and they're just, they're just so willing and like a sponge to suck up the gospel. It's wonderful. But we have to tell it and tell it and tell it again. Amen? Okay, one more one more special. No more specials? 448. 448. 
brethren we have met to worship. That's true. Do you want to come up and help me, Amelia? He does, but he's, what does this mean? <laughs> well, last Sunday we had, or was it Wednesday night, we had the, the uh, Baptist Church choir up here. It was amazing. Okay, well, let's sing this, brethren. We have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. the group with us tonight from Faithway and I understand that you have about six or so songs or whatever you have and it's going to take the pretty much much of the service and then we're going to have pastor come and preach to us give us open the word to us amen and we are going to give you complete authority in this pulpit brother and uh, we just want you to give it to us put it on the bottom shelf so even I can understand it amen because we need to hear from God tonight. Amen? Amen. Okay. If you'd like to come now, that would be great. Good evening. My name is Kyron Bolinia. I'm in my second year of study for a Bachelor of Theology degree. Hello. My name is Dale Sunico, and I am currently in my third year for a study of a Bachelor of Theology degree. My name is Marco Cacciola, and I will be graduating next year with a Bachelor of Religious Education degree. Hello, my name is Aaron Marquez. I am a senior, and I'll be graduating with a Bachelor of Religious Education degree. And I am Jacob Aquino. I am a graduate with a Bachelor of Religious Education degree. Ephesians 5.19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Our prayer is that you will be reminded about the grace of God, to praise Him for who He is, and to be encouraged in your service to Him. Psalm 107 verse 1 says, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so.
the bitter mark of sin will never fade away but i can come before him unashamed i stand redeemed by the blood of the lamb i stand redeemed before the great i am when he looks at me liberty, I stand redeemed, I stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, I stand redeemed before the great I am, when he looks at me, he sees the nail-scarred hands that bought my liberty, I stand redeemed, I stand redeemed, I stand redeemed. Hebrews 4.16 tells us that we can come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of Jesus, greater than all my sin, how shall my tongue describe it, where shall its praise begin, taking away my burden, setting my spirit free, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful, the matchless grace, the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Higher than the mountains, great. All sufficient for me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions. Greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty for the wonderful grace of jesus reaches me wonderful the matchless grace the matchless grace of jesus deeper than the mighty rolling sea the rolling sea higher than the miracles praise all sufficient for me for even me Broader than the scope of my transgression, singing, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful the matchless grace, wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Psalm 145, verse 2 says, Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. The origins of this song, How Great Thou Art, can be found with a Swedish pastor by the name of Carl Boberg around 1886. Boberg's inspiration came one day when he was caught in a thunderstorm off the southeastern coast of Sweden. The violence of the storm, followed by the return of the sun and the singing of birds, left him falling onto his knees in awe. He then penned nine stanzas of the original version in Swedish, and it was later translated into English by Stuart K. Hine. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. Psalm 8 verse 3 says, 
When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art.
lush verdant valleys where we walk sure and strong or the rugged terrain unsafe and long god has promised his help fear not i will guide you take my hand for my promises are true and this we know in the journey of life whether green rolling hills or the deserts bare and dry in all things god works for our good for those who love the In the seasons of life, times of joy or despair, victory and defeat, I know the thoughts I have for you, says your God, thoughts to prosper you, not to harm you, thoughts to give you hope and a future. Believe in me, trust in me, for I am your God. And this we know in the journey of life, whether green rolling hills or the deserts bare and dry, in all things God works for our good, for those who love the Lord. In all things God works for our good, for those who love the Let thy 
grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to Thee. Prone to wander, wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave, leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. of your grace flow from our hearts into this place till we see you face to face Lord tune our hearts to sing your grace tune our hearts to sing your sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The world lies in darkness lost in their sin and they don't even know the danger they're in we who are called to that glorious fight must shine like a beacon of love in the night we will carry the torch we will lift high the flame we will march through the darkness with the light of His name Till the glory of God is seen by the world We will carry the torch of the Lord There's no need for failure, no need for fear For the Lord goes before us to make our path clear let that glorious flame, let that glorious light, let it shine up through you and shine, let it shine in the night. We will carry the torch, we will lift high the flame, we will march through the darkness with the light of his name, till the glory of God is seen by the world. We will carry the torch of the Lord. The torch is our Savior, the hope for all men. And as we lift him up, he will draw all men to him. We will carry the torch, we will lift high the flame. We will march through the darkness with the light of His name Till the glory of God is seen by the world We will carry the torch of the Lord Carry the torch of the Lord We will carry the torch of the Lord Carry the torch We will carry the torch of the Lord privilege already just to be here with you guys and we certainly appreciate the privilege of uh, Pastor Rich allowing us to come. He was actually there at our college 
a few months back and preached our chapel, did a wonderful job. I've not had a chance really to get him to, to know him um, greatly, but I look forward to the opportunity to do so. Wish he was here tonight, but it is a wonderful blessing to be here uh, with you. Appreciate your prayers for our college. Of course, we represent Faithway Baptist College of Canada as a ministry of Faithway Baptist Church in Ajax, Ontario. Uh, our college has just actually celebrated its 37th commencement. And we, uh, our pastor, I think it was just a few months ago, uh, began to tally all the different graduates uh, over the course of the years. And there's close to 400 graduates of Faithway Baptist College of Canada serving throughout Canada, serving throughout the world. And so that is not a testimony to us or to our greatness. That's a testimony to God's goodness and God's grace. And so uh, we focus on missions, on music, on essentially full-time ministry. And we try to prepare and to influence that next generation as they go out and serve in churches just like this. In fact, one of our students, I believe uh, Dean Seneca, will be here just in the coming weeks. And I know he's anticipating that and looking forward to that. What a great opportunity and what a great church for him to be a part of and to be able to serve in. And it is, our, it is our, really our, our prayer and our desire that God would continue to raise up young people, middle-aged people, older people that would continue to have a heart either for full-time ministry or just have a desire to serve in their local church. There's a great need throughout Canada, is there not? There's many churches without pastors. There's many churches in need of individuals that just have a heart for God, that desire to serve Him. And so my prayer uh, for you is that you would pray for us. God commands us uh, to pray for laborers, that God would raise up laborers into His harvest field. And I would ask you, I would implore you, would you pray that with us? Would you pray that God would continue to raise up young people throughout Canada, that God would send them, those that have a call, or those that just desire to have some part in doing something for eternity, that we could influence, that we could invest, and that we could prepare them to go out and to serve Jesus Christ. I won't be long. I'm not sure how many of you are sitting in the pew thinking, this has been really nice, but if I you know, snuck a peek at my watch, it's about 10 minutes till. And you might be thinking, this guy better not be long-winded. Well, I will try my best not to be. Uh, the theme, really, I think, through the congregational singing and through the gentlemen and their singing has been a focus on God. Uh, we talked about in our congregational, God is our Father, God is our friend. And as you think about the song, How Great Thou Art, that will really be the focus of the message this evening. If you will, I'll invite you to turn your Bible to Psalm chapter 147. And I will try to keep my message between 15 and 20 minutes. I want to give you something from the Word of God that will help you, that will encourage you, and that will strengthen you. Uh, but, again, I do not want to go very long. Psalm 147, if you will look with me in verse number 1. We'll read from verse 1 through verse number 5. After I read verse number 5, I'll pray and we'll get right into the message. Psalm 147, notice the first verse, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God. I think we could all testify to that this evening in the congregational singing, the singing that we just heard, that it is good to sing praises, not necessarily only for the benefit of others, but in praise to Jehovah God. Notice verse 1, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. That's a good reminder for me. I remember uh, hearing a quote. I say this oftentimes in different churches because it's something that's really resonated with me. I think it was A.W. Tozer said that Christians do not tell lies, they just sing them. And when I heard that, I thought, oh my goodness, it feels like a spiritual dagger to the heart. And he was somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but essentially he was saying that it can become our habit that when we go through the kind of the perfunctory habit of singing that we don't necessarily think about the words. And there have been many a times that I've I sat there in the pew or stood there in the congregation singing, and then there's been that Holy Spirit conviction that says, Eli, do you really mean what you're singing about? And may God put that check upon our heart that when we do worship and we do praise, it truly is out of a heart of sincerity. And it's been a wonderful refreshment to my soul to be in a church that sings out and prays and worship to God. Notice verse number two, the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart 
and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Verse number five, notice it. I'll read this verse and then we'll pray. It says, great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your greatness. We thank you for already how we've been blessed through song and through fellowship. We do pray now uh, as we look to your word that our hearts would be touched, that they would be encouraged, and that through your spirit and through your word that you would give us exactly what we need this evening. We pray for Pastor Rich for Beacon Baptist Church, that you would continue to bless this church, continue to bless the sweet spirit that is here, uh, Welland and the surrounding areas is in need of uh, a light that continues to shine the gospel. And I pray that you would continue to strengthen this church and use them. Lord, collectively, we pray that you would continue to raise up laborers uh, into your harvest field. Lord, I pray for your word, that it would be uh, given with authority, that it wouldn't be my wisdom or my words, but God, that you would speak. We trust you. We need you and love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. No one knows exactly uh, who penned this particular psalm. Many of the times there are indications within a psalm that you can look back to and say, well, David wrote this psalm. In fact, David wrote a good majority of the psalms, over 70 in fact. Asaph wrote many of the psalms. Moses actually penned a few of the psalms. As we look at this particular psalm, we don't know who the human penman is, but we do know who the divine penman is, and that is God himself. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Again, not only the authorship, but oftentimes with different psalms, uh, scholars and commentators can kind of get the general context of when a particular psalm was written. If you do a study through a, a psalm, I would encourage you to understand that. Knowing the background, knowing the context can give you a fuller meaning and a fuller understanding of the words that are being spoken in a particular psalm. One suggestion by Jameis Fawcett and Brown about when this psalm was given says this, it would have been represented as specially designed to celebrate the rebuilding of Jerusalem. I won't take time to go through the nation of Israel and their history, but you remember they rebelled against God, the southern kingdom did, and so God would use the Babylonians to come in and attack them and essentially destroy Jerusalem. Not only would they destroy the city walls, they would pillage the temple and they would destroy the temple. The temple was that representation of God's presence, of God's blessing. It was a very significant place for the nation of Israel and that would be destroyed. You could imagine how devastating that was to the nation of Israel. Um, this was their, so to speak, pride. This was their joy. This was God's chosen place. This was God's city and now it lays desolate. Now it's nothing but ruins. Now it's nothing but rubble. Coming through that in 70 years of captivity, they're coming out, and it could be in that particular context that this psalm is being written. Though we may not know the exact author, and though we may not know the exact timing of this particular psalm, we do know who the focus is, and that focus of this psalm is on God, Jehovah the Lord. It's broken into three different stanzas. Many of the songs that we sing even today typically have three different or four different stanzas that we typically sing. If you notice this psalm, it begins with praise ye the Lord. There is a call to praise, and then the psalmist gives the cause or the reason. It's, if you will, an invitation, praise God, then we might step back and think, why? And then the psalmist gives the reason why. The first stanza does that, and we see this in verse 7. The next stanza, he says, Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. So here we see once again the call, and then in the next few verses describe the cause. Then we see in verse 12, the last stanza, he says, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. As we look at this psalm, the primary purpose of this psalm is to lift the attention of the hearers, specifically the nation of Israel, not to reflect on the difficulties of their past, not to reflect even on the difficulties of their present, not even to reflect on the burdens that they may or may not have, 
But the idea of this psalm is to lift their attention above this earthly life and to lift it to the eternal, to focus upon their God, their Redeemer, their King, their Jehovah, their Yahweh. That is the goal. That is the desire. That is the purpose. And he says to praise. That word praise means to boast, to glorify God. I don't know about you, but especially over these last few years, it can be a great temptation to focus on our individual lives. Oftentimes, maybe it's the good things, maybe it's the busyness, maybe it's our schedule, maybe for some of us it's a looking forward to a summer vacation now that we're in a post-COVID kind of era. Maybe it's things getting back to normal, maybe it's time with family. Maybe it's the difficulties of these last few years. There's been people within our church that have lost loved ones. That hurts. That's a difficulty. I'm sure there's a sense of emptiness. There's probably burdens, maybe financial burdens, health burdens, physical burdens, spiritual burdens. And oftentimes what church and what we have through the word of God is that instead of focusing on ourselves or focusing on another person or focusing on our past or the burdens of our past, the word of God allows us to lift our attention up to God and focus on his goodness to focus on his greatness, to focus on his love, on his compassion. And the psalmist here focuses, again, these words on the greatness and goodness of our God. Verse 5 says, great is our Lord. I want to give you just one thought this evening from the very first stanza about the greatness of the Lord. Number one, the greatness of the Lord is seen in his compassion. The nation of Israel had blessings. God had been faithful to them, though they many times were not faithful to him. I see myself oftentimes in the nation of Israel. It's amazing how critical I can become of the nation of Israel until God reveals the fact that essentially I am no better than the nation of Israel. They had blessings, and yet they also had burdens. They had been through many victories, but they had also been through many defeats. One of the most difficult things for them to endure was the destruction of this city to be a mockery amongst the surrounding nations, not just any nations, but the Gentile nations. They were God's chosen people, their covenant nation, the one elected, the one that God entered into this covenant relationship with, back with Abraham and then to Moses. This was God's people, and yet They had been through many difficulties and hardships, and yet through all of this, the psalmist begins to describe God's greatness through his compassion. I want you to notice this. Notice verse number two. It says, the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. That word build up means to establish or to build. Oftentimes in our lives, we can see the rubble of our lives. Uh, In fact, when you look at the book of Nehemiah, when he was commissioned to rebuild the wall around the city of Jerusalem, there came a point, because they had received mockery and threats, that they became very discouraged, so discouraged that the people began to speak out and say, all we see is this rubbish, all we see are these stones, and they became very despondent in their spirit. There are times in our Christian journey that we can be the same way. We can see just the negative. We can see just the difficulties. We can see only the hardships and only the things that could potentially go wrong. And we might think, well, I know I ought to build a strong family. Here we're celebrating Father's Day, and certainly many fathers have thought, I want to build a home that honors and brings glory to Jesus Christ. We're in church today, and here we have the opportunity to worship God and to praise God and to be together. But certainly as a church, you might look at the surrounding area and think, more people need to hear about Jesus Christ. I mean, that's why the church is here, to use us as vessels of reconciliation to draw people to share the glorious gospel with others. And yet, sometimes it really feels overwhelming for us in college ministry as we train young people and try to influence and help them. But yet, 
to see the need within Canada, sometimes the weight of that can seem overwhelming. And I don't know your situation. I don't know the difficulties that you may be facing. I don't know what you might feel as if God is trying to do something or build something in your life, but you might be thinking, I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. I don't have the ability. But don't miss this. Here we see for the nation of Israel, it was not left up to a Nehemiah to build, though God would use Nehemiah. It was not up to a Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple, though God would use a Zerubbabel. It was not up to an Ezra. It was not up to a Jeshua. There was one with omnipotent, omniscient ability that is Jehovah God that says, I will build. And can I remind you this evening, no matter what area of life God is working in, and you might be thinking, I can't do this, and I don't have the energy to do this, and I don't have the talent to do this, I don't have the ability to do this, but we serve a God that says, I have all power in heaven and in earth. And he is able to take rubble He is able to take stones and make it into something glorious. He promised the nation of Israel he would never leave them. He would never forsake them. And here he promises to them, I will build. Can I remind you this evening that we do not build a home alone. We do not build a church alone. We do not build a strong marriage alone alone, we have an omnipotent God that empowers us, strengthens us, guides us, encourages us, and lifts us up. And aren't you glad that we serve a God that is willing to take broken vessels that have failed him numerous times, instead of casting us to the side, he says, I will build. Not only do we see He's a God that builds. We see his compassion in the fact that he gathers. Notice verse number two, the latter part. He says, he gathereth together the outcast of Israel. That word gather means to collect or to wrap up. The word outcast means those that were thrown down or driven away. I don't know about you, but there's been many a times in my Christian journey that I have felt as if I was the odd man out. No one had the same burdens that I had. No one has the same struggles that I do. No one goes to the same type of difficulties that I have to go through. And sometimes you just feel like you are all alone in this Christian journey, that you are the one that seemingly is ostracized. And let me say this, there might be some individuals here that that is not just something perceived, but that is your true reality. We have people within our church Uh, that really have been ostracized by family because of their faith in Jesus Christ. We have a young lady that has just immigrated uh, as a refugee, really, from Afghanistan that is now part of our church, and she's living with a sponsor. She has a connection with them, though she's not related to them, and really she has to keep her Christianity under wraps for fear of the fact of, I don't know if it's necessarily physical persecution, but certainly there would be resistance to her being a Christian. And you think about that. You think about going through that. You think about being uh, uninvited or the fact that you feel like there's distance between you and a coworker because you told them you're a Christian or a sibling because you try to be faithful to Jesus Christ. I think everybody understands what I'm trying to communicate here. We've all felt like that at times in our life. And to feel as if maybe no one understands and no one is willing to accept or to receive us, and yet we see one that specializes in receiving and accepting the outcast. Aren't you glad this evening that we serve a God that will take the most bruised, the most broken, the most unlikely, and the most undesirable, and say, come unto me, and I will give you rest. What a compassionate God we serve. Could we all not say, great is our Lord. He is great because he builds. He is great because he gathers. Notice this as well. 
verse number three, he healeth. And notice who he heals. The word heals means to make healthful or to cure, to repair. He cures or he repairs. Notice the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. My and my life, I grew up in the United States of America and at one time my family lived in the state of Utah. And Utah is a beautiful state surrounded by mountains. And so during that time we started snowboarding, my brother and I and my sister actually as well, skiing and snowboarding, which we really enjoyed. Well, especially as a teenager, you think you can do everything that you see on TV. That is not the truth, especially with my talent. But you still try. Unfortunately, through that, I broke both of my arms, not at the same time, praise God for that. But I did break both of my arms, and you have to go through the whole process of the casting, and they do the x-rays and everything like that. Well, of course, when you come to church the next day, all your buddies are like, oh my goodness, what happened? What did you do? And it's very apparent that something is wrong, right? I mean, it's not as if you can hide a massive cast underneath your suit jacket or, you know, hide it under your coat. They're going to find out. It's visible to the eye. And maybe you could tell a story about a time that maybe you broke a finger or a foot or something like that. Those are typically very apparent to the physical eye. However, there's something that oftentimes gets broken that no one knows about. It's not observable. In fact, we can come to church and sit next to someone day after day and even year after year, and they're still not aware of this. And it's that which takes place internally. The idea here from broken means something that has been crushed. Something that has been broken in pieces. There have been times that I've sat in a church just like this, listening to a message very similar to this. And though no one else knew it, inside and internally, I was broken. Did I sing? Yes. Did I smile? Yes. Did I shake hands? Yes. Would anybody be able to tell that anything was wrong with me? Probably not. But there was one that did know. And not only did he know about what was going on internally, he was not only aware of it, but he had the ability to help me with that internal problem. I love this. Charles Spurgeon said this, Hearts are broken through disappointment. Hearts are broken through bereavement. Hearts are broken in 10,000 ways, for this is a heart breaking world. And Christ is good at healing all manner of hearts. He goes on, says he describes the reasons why Jesus Christ is good at healing broken hearts. He says this, number one, Jesus is educated for this work, having his own heart broken. Secondly, he says, Jesus is experienced in this work, having healed broken hearts for 2,000 years. Jesus is willing to take the worst patients and has never yet lost a patient. Jesus heals broken hearts with medicine that he himself provides. We serve the great physician. There have been times when I have talked to an individual and they have told me their story and I think, if I went through a similar situation, I think I would have gone crazy. You ever listen to people and hear their story? Maybe some of you have a similar story where you just listen to maybe a, their upbringing as a child or the events through their adulthood and you think, how are you still holding it together? And yet as we look at this particular verse, the psalmist praises God, because he can take that which no one else can see, and he can heal it. Coming from the United States, one of the biggest blessings, we've been in Canada for four years, is that there is health care provided through the government. Now, that can obviously be a blessing and a cursing, but coming from the United States, where a small procedure could cost you thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars, it's a blessing. There have been times that I've been to the doctor and maybe there's, you know, a cough or there's something, that type of pain. And I would go to them and I'd say, hey, I'm having this issue. Something's going on. And so they, you know, check your heart and maybe they give you, you know, take your blood and do some other test. And then after you've waited there for, you know, a few hours thinking, how much is this going to cost me a couple months later? 
they finally come back in and they say, well, uh, I've got bad news. I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm not sure what the problem is. I'm not sure why you're having this pain. I'm not sure why there's a shortness of breath. I don't know what is going on. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little piece of paper. I'm going to write you a referral. And I'm going to send you to someone that specializes in these type of issues. And hopefully they'll be able to help you. Now, that can be very frustrating, but you know what's a wonderful reminder for us as believers? God doesn't give referrals. You never go to God and say, well, you know, I'm going through this marriage issue, and, I, and God says, eh, I've never seen one like this before. Let me see if I can write you a referral. He specializes in it. There's no issue maybe at your work or with your kids or in your family or within your church or with your own internal struggles and difficulties that when you bring them before an omniscient, omnipotent God, that he's going to look at that and say, well, either I don't have time for that or I'll send that off to someone else. Never does our God react in that way. He knows exactly what to prescribe. And when you come to him and you enter into his throne room, humbly, with faith, God says, I've seen this before. In fact, I've gone through this before. Because he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And I know exactly what to do for you. Sometimes the prescription doesn't, maybe it's not a pill and it's gone. Sometimes it might take a little bit of time for God to heal and to help. But yet he is the great physician. Notice he telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Verse 5 almost seems like a parenthetical statement. It's almost as if the psalmist stops at what is just said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what he declares here is, Great is our Lord. Could we reflect this week on the greatness of God? Where is his greatness seen? It's seen in his compassion. Is it seen in many other areas? Absolutely. But we serve a God that can build. We serve a God that can heal. We serve a God that is the great physician that has all power and he's infinite. And may we as believers take time to lift our eyes above the earth above ourselves and lift them up to God Almighty, to praise him, to trust him, to pray to him, and to worship him. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you so much for your love. God, truly, I think we all could testify to your goodness and greatness in our lives. There's been times, Lord, that I have doubted you. There has been times when I have not been faithful to you, and yet you're merciful, you're patient, you're kind, and you're gracious. Lord, we rejoice in that. We thank you for that. As your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, I'll just have the pianist play just a verse or two of invitation. And I would encourage you that as you pray, you would just thank God, praise God, reflect on his goodness, reflect on his grace.